Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Karen Miga. I'm part of the Nanopore group from Santa Cruz. And I'm very pleased to be able to share our work with you today on linear assembly of the Y centromere in human. So I think it's no surprise to anyone here that there's a new excitement in the genomics field for long reads. And when I say long reads, I mean reads that span tens of kilobases to hundreds of kilobases now, affordable high sequence coverage, and also very incredibly long sequence assemblies with very high end 50s. Now, I want you to keep that in mind. With all of these advances, however, we're still not completely there with our best reference assemblies. And I'm going to even stress for the human reference assembly when I'm talking about huge gaps that exist, for example. What I'm showing you here is that each human chromosome assembly has a multi-megabase gap that is found within each region that assigns to a centromere or pericentromeric region. Now, over the past 10 years, we've had a lot of advances with, with sequence technology, longer reads, lots of diversity on how to treat genome assembly and complexity. And all of these really big involvements and in, in sequence technologies have taken place almost strictly on the chromosome arm. And I would say to date, no sequence technology or even combination of sequence technologies have even started to address the main problem of traversing a human centromere. And I would say the reason for that is because it's actually quite difficult to get a true um, haploid representation of a linear assembly for human centromeres. And the reason why is because it's very repeat rich. For example, what I'm showing you here is the primary sequence that you can find for human centromeres or satellite DNA. Satellite DNA are tandem repeats. So I'm showing you here with one sequence directly following another in a head to tail orientation. However, unlike tandem repeats that are throughout the entire human genome, in human centromeric regions, these tandem repeats are found in a head to tail for millions of bases. So one might assume that this is a challenge that would only take in the, the sequence reads as well as the abundance of the sequence, but I say that's a challenge we need to meet. And it would, by addressing this particular challenge, what we're doing is we're actually meeting a very fundamental genomic milestone. And it's not only just to compete, complete one human centromeric region, but that moves us one step closer to what I would say is the goal of genome assembly, which is to generate a telomere to telomere chromosome assembly. And perhaps just as important is this idea that by doing this, we're actually signaling that technology has taken a step forward and we're actually working towards closing the gap and aiming for a complete genome assembly. Before I move on, I want to go ahead and talk about the problems that we actually face when you're trying to do these types of genome assemblies. The basic problems I'm showing you here, for example, if you had tandem repeats that were identical to one another and they occupied a span of 100 kilobases. You would have on either side, which I'm highlighting in orange and green, unique sequences. And let's say you had a short read library, and I'm calling short reads 10KB. And the reason I'm calling them 10KB is because that's insufficient to actually span unique sequence. And as you all know, when you have these types of short libraries over tandem repeats, you end up with inferred assembly collapse or misrepresentation of the linear assembly. The clear way to bypass this, which I think a lot of speakers at this meeting are going to actually discuss, is the idea that you can use long reads that actually span the unique sequences, and therefore you get a complete representation or true representation of the repeats. And when you do this multiple times, you can sample and then go through and derive a high-quality consensus. Now, this is a very easy example compared to what human centromeres actually look like. We're talking about 10 times typically the size of this toy example that I gave for 10 kilobases. And here, 100 KB I would call a short read because 100 KB is too short to typically span a lot of these unique sequences in order to enable assembly. Now, many of you out there might be thinking of a solution in which maybe there are unique markers that are within these particular sites that are useful for guiding this kind of overlap assembly strategy in human centromeres. And we do know that in human centromeric regions, there are insertions of transposable elements which can guide unique signatures, as well as actual structural rearrangements that take place within the repeat itself that can cause a unique, if you can think of it as a scar, as well as these single nucleotide variants. 
Now, studies in human centromeres would suggest that these single nucleotide variants are actually the most prevalent thing that's going to be useful for guiding these types of assembly, and that will require a very high quality or high accuracy for base calling. But just to understand how one sequence is not the whole problem, I'm gonna actually throw it out. The problem is when you go to diploid genomes, is what I'm showing you here. And so for one example, for the diploid genome, you have not only the same repeat on both homologous chromosomes, but on one maternally inherited per, um, chromosome, you could have a subset of reads, and on the other one, you have a subset of reads that map to the same repeat sequence. Now the problem is phasing these reads that you can begin to do some type of local assembly work, and that's incredibly difficult. And let's say you could bypass even the diploid problem for these particular regions. What you can find is that the satellite repeats, for example, on chromosome 18, may share significant sequence similarity with a satellite on chromosome 20. Therefore, when you pull the reads together and you begin to assemble, you're now building a hybrid between two different chromosomes. So it's actually quite difficult to move into these regions, even with a strategy where you, you have an understanding of the sequence variants. So I would argue there's really three key advances to resolve these particular regions that we need to pay attention to as a community. One, as I introduced, is you need to have a strong understanding of these chromosome assigned satellites and sequence structure. Second, you need to actually have increased sequence throughput of long reads. It's not enough to get a one long read. It's not enough to get 10 long reads. The throughput of long reads in order to traverse these regions have to be one of the major attributes that we're aiming for. And also, as I mentioned, it's very important to have high quality base calls to ensure that you're able to get these single copy sites in the array in order to make it across. So uh, the work I'm going to be talking about today is working on a linear assembly of the centromere on the Y. And so in order to do that, we had to have a basic understanding of chromosome assignment of the satellite sequencing content. As we all know, the Y chromosome is a haploid array, so that's very useful to bypass that diploid problem. The satellite repeat that's present is well characterized by Chris Tyler Smith and William Brown back in 1987. And that particular array we know is specific to the Y, so we don't have the problem of cross hybridization with other chromosomes. Also, I'm going to note this is one of the smallest arrays in the human genome, so this is exactly where you want to start when you're going to put centromeres together. The second challenge that we had to face was how do we begin to increase the sequence throughput of high molecular weight reads, not generating one or two high molecular reads, but getting to a point where the majority of the reads that come through our midion are high molecular weight. And in order to do that, we've been using a back-based strategy where we know that, for example, a circular back that contains centromere DNA could be roughly 200 kilobases in length, and then you enter that into the midion, and then you have an expectation for both the sequence length and throughput. The BACs I'll be discussing today are a collection of nine BACs that are known to span the Y centromere. It was published in a Nature paper by David Page's group back in 2001. And so in this case, we now have a, a set that we can begin to put together a few human centromere. The second problem that we had to address was not only the sequence depth and the sequence length, but to ensure that we were working with high quality base calls. And so in order to do that, we've established a strategy where you can take the back, you can sequence it to high depth, and then you can use a multiple alignment strategy to get a high quality derived consensus sequence. And we've also aligned that step with doing resequencing for each back using Illumina sequencing as a truth set. So then we can begin to look at these individual variants as well. So the first part of my talk is really looking at this high quality tandem repeat sequence that you can generate using back DNA. The protocol that we're using, I believe Matane already um, introduced yesterday if you were lucky enough to attend his talk, and this is using the UCSC Longboard 1D protocol. The idea here is that you're using a back of a, as I already introduced, containing high molecular weight of interest. You can go ahead and use this particular transposase adapter and linearize the back. We've optimized our protocol to get this linearization process to happen up with only a single NIC, so you can maintain the entirety of the length of the back. You go through a step of ligation where you adapt, put on the adapters and the tethering attachment, and then we run it straight through midion sequencing. 
And when we do this, the exciting thing is we see a peak exactly where you expect the size of the back to be, or in 50s for these 1D reads. We see them on the order of 100 plus, and we're getting the coverage that we need, hundreds of reads that map over the, the entire length of the back. This is just a slide to show you kind of a representation of the nine backs that we're using for the centimeter plus the control back. And what I want you to take away from this is that in total, since we've started this, we have over 3,500 reads which are greater than 150 kb in length. Now, if you were using each read alone, you would have insufficient quality to work with centromeric sequence assembly. This is, even though the sequences are actually quite improved, what I'm showing you here is the data from the most recent um, NA12878 human genome paper that was published by Jane et al., and I put the information below here. And this is of roughly 1.9 gigabases from 291 reads where I can show you the alignment length by percent identity, and I want you to take away this kind of shift where we see the median percent identity is around 84%. This is way too many false positives to be useful for centromeric sequence analysis, and along with the insertions, deletions, and mismatches that I've listed here. But what you can do is you can take these sequences and you can sample them, for example. You can go through full length and you can generate a multiple alignment. And you can do this 10 different times and you can go through polishing. And you can end up with a final high quality consensus sequence. And the interesting thing that we found is that you actually can make a really high consensus sequence with very modest coverage. And so if you sample 10, 30, 60, 90 read full length reads, and if you're looking at 20x, 10x or 1x when you're looking at the cycles of the multiple alignment, you automatically you're jumping up to 98 and 99% identity. We selected for our analysis the sampling at 60 and doing it 10 times, and that's the data I'll be sharing with you today. So this is one back, for example, which is the 718M8, which spans roughly 221 kilobases. Um, this seems like it's pretty straightforward. You run it on a min-ion, and then all of a sudden you get the sequence, and you can start to analyze it. But I want to stress that this is actually the longest satellite that's ever been assembled that I'm aware of. There are papers written on 90 kilobases of satellite that are being um, assembled, even in the human genome paper, which bragged about, uh, understandably, about ultra-long reads and how exciting that is. Even the longest assembled region was only 100 kilobases or 140 kilobases. So this is one of the longest ones that we had found. Uh, what I'm showing you here is you have a very tiny vector. The insert is in gray. The repeats that are present in this particular array, we have 38 of them. There's 98% identity to a published repeat, and I'll get back to that, because the errors that I'm finding, there's 634 of them that we can now detect in these particular regions, and there's two tandem structural rearrangements. There's also one feature of satellite, which I think is important to go into when you're actually studying the nature of the errors that we're seeing, and that is that we're seeing homopolymers A and homopolymers T in these particular backs. So I anticipated going into this, we'd have some false positives and some false negatives, and we needed to tease those apart. So we did the resequencing on Illumina, so we have kind of a truth set of the sequences we do expect to be in the back. And by doing that, you can do a K-mer analysis, where I'm using five MERS, and you can be able you start to ask relative to a reference back and five K-mers for the Illumina versus the Oxford nanopore reads that we were using. And you can see for the Illumina data set, you get a really lovely correlation between what you expect and what you actually get in the Illumina data set. And then we also see a very strong correlation when you look at the Oxford nanopore reads. There's only one outlier that really popped out, and that was a fibromer that includes a homopolymer of A's and T's. And as I introduced in my previous slide, that's exactly the type of feature that's common to these satellite sequences. And when, if you look at what kind of um, homopolymers we're looking at, we have all the way to eight MERS, and what we're seeing is an over-representation slightly between seven MERS and eight MERS. But this is really nice because it's helped guide a lot of our error correction when we prepared our backs. And between taking the error correction step as well as looking for the Illumina to actually validate the single copy sites, we could then eliminate a lot of the false positives and identify 23, only 23, of these sites that were single copy and had adequate sequence coverage by the Illumina data set, meaning about 600x coverage, to suggest that they're true variants.
So by using this back, we can now begin to move into a stage where we're looking at the assembly of the centromere array, right? And we can put it together and have the first representation of a human centromere. And so what I'm showing you here are the nine backs where we use the informative markers and the structural variants to overlap them. When you put all of these backs together, you can derive a new consensus for the human centromere in this particular region, which is 346 kilobases in length. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, this particular array was anticipated to be a smaller array. And this is once again followed up with data from the 1000 genome data set where you can go in and look at population match samples such as Western European to see that this number is actually where you would expect to find. Um, the RP11 library that I'm using, I should stress, is an R1B or an individual who is associated with populations from Western Europeans. And so that is why we see this concordancy between Western Europeans and the size of this particular array. Also, if we look strictly, because it's why we have the advantage of looking at Y haplogroup data, and if you look at the R1B, I have 139 individuals, and the median for that particular array size is 350 KB, and the range is somewhere between 220 to 460. So we're definitely looking at the correct range of the size. The nice thing here, too, is that you can begin to say, well, this is a back library. There's not an associated cell line to go through and validate. So it's really hard to say if this is absolutely the case. But since we do have individuals that we know are the same haplogroup, maybe we can use those cell lines to see if that gives us similar information. And so you can imagine if this is the genome, and this is a, our hypothesized or our derived array that we had from our experiment, which is 346. We can find restriction enzymes that do not cut within the array that we've looked for, but do cut directly outside. You can then take the size of the array and the size of each flanking region and have a predicted length when you do something like a postcode southern, which is what I'm going to show you here, using the HUREF genome, which is a haplogroup match data set, in which now when you take the PBU2, you're looking at a range about 380 to 440, which is the line, and also 700 to 750. Also in the literature, there is previous analysis by Chris Tyler Smith and William Brown once again to do structural analysis for the centromeric region. And when they did a similar type post food gel, they found very similar numbers as well. So this is all pointing back to the fact that we think that we have the correct um, centromere assembly. So there's a lot of future work on where this could go. That's Understandably, the next place we want to go is to move away from the back-based approach and move into genomic DNA. And it's very much in our attention that if you actually went into a human genome that was an RB1, you could probably get long enough reads to span this and close it without having to do a back-based approach, derive this high-quality sequence. But what this would require is, once again, this long read sequencing where you have four to 500 KB and a coverage is 30 to 60 coverage. So this is something that takes, once again, some optimization. So that's exactly what we're doing at UCSC. We're optimizing our 1D protocol strategy, we're calling it version 2.0, where we're trying to increase long read sequence from libraries now prepared from whole genomic data sets. And we're trying to get our throughput to where we have not only an occasional long read, but we have consistently picking up these long read sequences that are useful for this analysis. And also, I'm working with the computational group at UCSC to go through and improve methods to ensure the base quality are able to accurately call um, a lot of these single variants that are necessary to put the centromeres together. And I would say critical to all of this is as a key understanding of the constructions of the maps that are involved with satellite sequence content and structure. And that's something we're very specialized at UC Santa Cruz, is we've been generating these types of sequence databases now for almost three years. And so what I'm showing you here is the data that was used for the HUREF genome, where we characterized all the variants and all the satellite arrays for one particular genome. And those were the sequences that were included in HG38. And since that time, we've been working through several other individuals to understand their variants as well. And this is going to be key for how we begin to put these genomes together and understand the variants that are necessary for assembly. So with that, I'll go ahead and end my talk, but I want to go ahead and recognize some of the people who put a lot of work into it. This is Matane Jane, who's been doing a lot of, of the work with the MinION. Hugh, as well, has been working with the pulse field information so we can go through in size and make sure all of the, the backs are lined up. Mark Akison's been wonderful for supporting this and being um, part of the team 
with the long read strategies. We have a lot of individuals who are pushing on the computational side of things to make sure that once we get this up and running that we can go through and, and push through and, and start to do some major assembly through these regions. As far as Oxford Nanopore, we have Dan Turner and, and David Stoddard who've been helping with a lot of the resources that we've been using to generate the back libraries. The SINBACs were through a collaboration with David Page's group at the Broad Institute and through my previous advisor, Hunt Willard. I'd like to reference the human genome data that I used in one of my slides, and then this is the product information. And at this point, I'll be happy to take any questions. That was a really lovely, impressive talk. So just um, how long? How long are the reads going to have to be to do all the centromeres? I, I, I actually don't kind of know my, the, you know, the maximal centromere length. Mm -hmm. And is there any benefit in artificially introducing mutations somehow, you know, in some step in between? Or, you know, some of this continuity processing here is about working out how to, to create the markers. So is there a strategy that actually kind of artificially Shatter pops some things in there in some way. Um, have you thought about that strategy? So two questions. Yeah, they're great questions. I feel like every centromere you look at the human genome is churning with non-homologous recombination conversion. So the answer is going to be different on the variants for each one. And I think the targeted strategy is challenging for that reason as well, because you have to have something that's uniform or a directive for each particular array. But with that in mind, I say if you have a megabase sized read, the average array sizes are three megabases. So you're getting to a point where you're going to find something at that point. So I feel like when I hear things like 950 coming from the, the Lumen Lab, I think that's extremely promising. The problem is also the diploid issue. So if you can span a complete centromeric region and you can get three megabase size reads, then we're, we're good with diploids. But <laughs> yeah, but until I think, um, I, I think this, there's a lot of promise there. I, I think there's definitely can be directive strategies that need to be in place, but I, I honestly think that with the resources, one can do it very soon. I think I, I saw in your plot um, the, the accuracy going down when you increase the number of reads in your multiple alignment mm -hmm. beyond the 60 you spotted. Um, what's going on? Yeah, that was concerning to us too. It seems that the more and more you add with the multiple aligner, it wants to interject some of the um, variants that it finds, so you're actually introducing more sequence. The sequence gets longer, and a lot of those are false positives. And so in that case, um, we, there's kind of a sweet spot that we're finding. And we did that with simulated sequences and also with a control back where we knew the reference sequence to more than just the, the vector sequence. So we've been playing around with that. I think that one of the things that is really useful with, with working with the computational lab at UC Santa Cruz is optimizing that um, multiple alignment step to see if we can actually get a little bit more robust. But we had such luck with doing it the other way, um, with taking this kind of sampling approach that it wasn't necessary.